We're back again on the Mitch Report on Leash podcast. Today I'm here by a guest that I feel like we're going to get in some deep, deep discussions about what overcoming adversity looks like and how it feels like for us. You know, Pete, Pete, my friend, how's it going? We're doing fantastic, thank you. Yourself? Oh, you know, it's another day in uh, the wild uh, west over here in Canada. So let's get into your story, because I feel like your story is very interesting when I read it on the website. You were a chef, and then you made a transition, right, into yes. coaching and things like that. Speak right. to the audience what that was like for you and uh, what made you want to go into the more coaching route, my friend. Okay, so I've coached all my life, and I've heard through my being and my life, oh, my God, I've never told anybody this before, again and again and again. And when I was at school, girls, older girls would always come and share their secrets with me. And it was just a thing. And I never told anybody the secrets, and it seemed to work. Then, yeah, I had my whole journey of, uh, of cooking, which feels like a past life. And then I was standing on a mountain in Peru, deep on plant medicine, on San Pedro, Wachuma. And I said to the shaman, I hadn't spoken to her this whole week, and I said to her, hey, look, I'm really curious um, to talk about my business. And she said, yep, we can talk about it, but I don't want any stories, just tell me your feelings. So in a couple of minutes, I told her that I wasn't so happy. And at the time, I'd been, I was cooking as a private chef, just little bits and pieces, dinner parties. And I also had this product called 60 at 60 which was luxury, slow-cooked lamb for 60 hours at 60 degrees in a sous vide bag. And the idea was you take it home, reheat it for 15 minutes, and uh, you'd have your dinner, restaurant quality. And she's, we had this conversation, and she spoke about how she owed this money on this business that she had. And she said, could you walk away from your business? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, when are you going to walk away from it? And I said, now. She said, cool. What will you do instead? And I looked at her straight in the eyes and without even thinking, I just said, oh, I'm going to coach people to reach their potential. She said, fantastic. When are you going to start? And I said, now. On the side of that mountain, mountain Al Sangasi in Peru, my life changed in a moment. When you, because I feel like we all face that, right? And I feel like a lot of folks that work a nine to five, I still work a nine to five. Mm -hmm. And I know some folks around me, they want to get into breaking away of what they call the matrix here in the North, North American uh, area. My question to you would be is, when you made that decision, was it something that was just, you said right, right now, was it something that you had to think about first and then set up the systems that set to go into place? Or was it just reality just struck at that present time for you? Okay, so my intention when I went on the pilgrimage to Peru was I want this to be life-changing. That's all I asked for. And every medicine journey was different. And I wasn't really happy. And I was kind of waiting for the opportunity to make a decision. As I'm sure you're familiar with, oh, I'll make it when, oh, when. And it's always in the future. Oh, when everything's is your ducks are all in a line. Well, they're never in a line, are they? And it's like, what well, more perfect time than right here in this moment to make this decision? And it just, yeah, I mean, it was so clear. There was no thinking. It was, yes. When we hear of intention, because you're an intentional person, we met on Google, you know, Google Hangouts and had a little back and forth and things like that. And Ashton August, who's into yoga, is the one who brought us together and things like mm -hmm. that. When we look at intention, why do you feel like some folks don't have clarity within their intention? Where does that come from? I think they don't know what they want. And if you don't know what you want, how can you intend to go where you want to go? It's like getting in a boat and going out from the harbor and not knowing where to go. Then you're at the mercy of what happens to you. The weather. Oh, God, it's raining. Oh, it's cold. Oh, it's hot. But if you've got a, you're going somewhere, will you pass through that weather? Because it's, oh, it's raining today, but I'm going here. Oh, it's hot. Yep. But I'm going here. And I think people lack that because they don't know what they want. And in a society where there is so much consumerism and talking about the matrix of what we're told and the patriarchy and how it all is, I think people have these blinkers on and it's like, okay, 
Yeah, I'm just going to do what I'm told and do what everybody else is doing. And I think that can be limiting. But that's not living a fulfillment of a life, you think? Right? That's not living a fulfillment of life for me. And you know what it's like, and I think we spoke about this before when we first chatted, is when people don't know, and there is no knowing that there's something outside, that can be bliss, that ignorance can be bliss because there's no journey. But for me and my life, I've been called for more to do more. And you can see that. That's the energy you radiate, right? So I feel like in a lot of us, we have big personalities, right? Myself, I'm a big personality podcast or things like that. And I feel like we can be totally misunderstood by how we're presented in the, in the general public, in the eyes. You know, you get into conversation in family, work groups, you know, acquaintance groups, and some folks just do more it's not, I don't say it's intimidating, I would say, maybe that's not the right word to say, but you can see that they're like, they shy away. They want to say something, but they're, it's the, it's the effect of what's going to end up happening. You know what I mean? And I've always been as like, actually in a conversation today, I said is doing more of myself to say what's in the moment, no matter what's going to happen. And it's like, it, cause I know I live on a safe space. I come from intentional with everything that it is I do. And I think that not everyone looks inward. Like you said, the blinders are on. But how do those blinders become removed? Somebody that's listening to this right now on the podcast, they could ask you. They could ask myself. What, how, do, how, do, how, does, how do I take those blinders off? Is it a book? Is it some spiritual journey they need to go on? What's that first initial thing they should do? Well, for me, what I hear just there from you is that like the book, it's all the external. And I think that's the problem is we're all being conditioned to go outwards. Like for me to take six really deep breaths, deep into my belly, fill my chest, breathe out really slowly, six times to really come to my center, then ask myself, hey, what's really going on? And then to tune into that. But I find, especially working with men, they find it very difficult. I've just had five or six clients that have all come through at the moment. And it's like, oh, okay, where do you feel that in your body? Oh, I don't know. They don't know their emotions. They don't know their feelings. And I think when you don't know that, that's the beginning. Hey, what's going on? Where is it in my body? What am I really feeling? Okay, so now I feel calm. I feel centered. But where is that? And it's, it's like, oh, it's here. How is it? It's like it's tingling. It's silvery. It's solid and there's magic around it. Oh, okay. If I'm feeling angry, it might be here and it's uncomfortable. It's, oh, okay. And I'll just witness that. But that's when I'm, I'm coming into me and that's what I encourage my clients to do is to come from really deep in yourself because you've only got you, right? You've only got this consciousness. That's all you can be really aware of and control, although we're looking outside to control everybody else and everybody else's business but when we deeply come into here i think that's where you can make a real solid decision from remove the blinkers of like okay what do i really want and sit with it horrible question people don't like it what do you want oh, 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 oh i don't know oh okay so the uncomfortableness in, is in not knowing yeah okay come sit yo guys what's going on i appreciate you thank you turn on all bell notifications subscribe like and comment to the podcast the best way to stay up to date and hey it helps us gain the clarity and boost ourselves into that algorithm we appreciate the support each and every day each and every week let's keep on going to keep on growing peace you speak a lot to when i did martial arts right my my master at the time said the exact same thing being grounded with one being center and i feel like no matter when you're doing your if you're sparring or say, for instance, you're doing your routine, you have to be centered, right? You look at any, even talk about combat fighting, you got to be centered. You know, you see a lot of them, if they're in a camp for eight weeks, if it's 16 weeks or however long, they cut off all the distractions. You'll see them go up to a mountaintop, they go high altitude. Why? Because they can't be focused in the day to day.
Some of them don't watch TV. Some of them don't. They're just maybe listening to music or maybe not listening to music. You know what I mean? And so what you say, it lands a lot because it reminds me of like old Bruce Lee in that black and white conversation, you know, in the interview where he said, be like water, you know, water can flow or can crash. And that element of pause that's there, you know what I mean? Because it's like, when I get on a podcast, it's, you get different types of vibes and things like that. So it's like, how do we make the audience understand what's really going on? Because you always want to make every single conversation more transformational, not transactional. I don't know if you've ever heard that before. So for yourself, you know, the life you've been through, you're over in Australia and things like that. Was it a lot of traveling that you've ended up doing to really see different parts of the world? Or was it more of just you just finding your location and really staying there? Yeah, I've traveled a lot. I've done a lot of traveling. That's one thing I absolutely love is traveling. Mm -hmm. And we had an eight month old daughter and we didn't know if Australia was going to be right. So we just agreed to put our stuff into storage. And we were going to come travel up the East Coast to see if we liked it with an open mind. We found this place that we liked. And we found the guy and said, hey, can you send our stuff over? And he's like, yep, sure. So he sent the stuff over. And that was the move to being here. But we saw a lot of different places. And there was different criteria of schooling, of how the vibe was, the weather, um, whether there was mountains and a beach. and basically where I am now, met that criteria. So that was the intention of what we wanted and where we wanted to be. And yeah, there was a few of those places and we chose one. And often people from that have said to me, oh my God, such a big move. How did you leave the UK? I had a conversation with my partner, my now wife, and said to her, what about moving? Yeah, okay. And then we made a decision. When we made that decision, then we booked tickets. And then we took the action and we got onto the plane and we flew here and then we were here. And that's how the change was made to be here. But it wasn't difficult. You did have, we made a decision and we did it. But I think people get caught with the blinkers. Oh my God, I can't leave here. I can't leave Johnny. I can't leave Sam. I can't leave my mom. I can't leave my dad. It's a short life. I think too many people choose it for other people. Mm. I felt that one. I felt that one because that's the thing. You know, you make decisions for yourself, not by based off of other folks. And I say that a lot of times in my friend groups and a lot of guys are, they hear it and it's like, does it land? But I know that not everyone you can, not everyone you'll resonate with. Some folks hold a certain space at that present time. And then there's some that, you know, you can go deep with and things like that. I feel like one of my biggest things is knowing that you've been all, for what it seems like, all over the globe. Speak to UK and Australia. Do you miss parts of it? Is there differences? Do you wish you could maybe take something from the UK, bring it to where you're at now, or vice versa? Well, I think living in London, this, this one is the culture and there's the age, which you don't get here in Australia like buildings that are really, really old that carry that energy. And just so much to do. You can go out every night of the week in London and you can see comedy, you can see live music, you can go to the theatre. There's all these different things. There's groups, there's workshops, improv, comedy, whatever you want to be doing, it's there. Where I live, there's less of that. And there's pros and cons, but I think there's more pros to living here than there is to living in the UK, which was the reason to move, not to bring a daughter up in the UK and to bring her up in nature, basically. And I feel like nature is something to all of us. That's where that grounding comes from. I hear a lot of different coaches. Yeah. Yeah. So speak to someone like myself. I'm in nature to a degree. Like we come... They call it, we come from the forest city. That's a long story for another day. We'll be here to like next year talking about that. Um, It's all about trees and stuff like that. Speak to how can the ones that want to get close to nature, what's the first starting point for them when it comes to getting on that ground of what nature is? Firstly, I wanted to say, go 
and I say into nature, to a forage, a forest, but some people prefer the beach. So I go, okay, that's nature, walking by the water. I prefer the forest. So I would tell somebody or encourage somebody yourself to take the breaths of like, well, where do I want to connect with in nature? Oh, I love the desert. Okay, well, how do you get to that open space? Which is still nature, but there's not so much greenery. I love the greenery and the plants. So I want to be in a forest. I want to be surrounded by different things that are growing. That's my jam. But you know what? If you grow in a city and you see a weed growing out a crack of a pavement and you really, really tune into that, that is nature. Hmm. Like any hmm. plant, any flower, any spider, any bird, anything is the connection. But the connection to that, to that, is they're all things. Nature is something that's growing. It's, it's a force. And you know what, super simply, I say to often to clients is I just take your shoes and socks off and stand on the grass. I close your eyes and feel, just be aware of what's going on. That sometimes can be enough. But a walk. When you're moving and you're in nature, like in the forest or on the beach or wherever you are, then look and be present. What can I smell? What can I see? What do I taste in my mouth? What can I touch? So wise. Bring yourself so wise. to the present moment in the nature. Like you're in the nature and you're on your phone. You're not in nature. You're looking at pixels. <laughs> I love how you say that. <laughs> it's not even real. You're, you're looking at something that's not even real, right? That's not real. Man. But people are looking at that at nature. Oh, look at that bird. Look at this. Birds flying in the sky. What about those? I was at a... It's so fun. It's funny you say that because it's like it's pixels. I was at a birthday dinner this past uh, this past weekend. And it's so wild because it was a group of... Six guys. And believe it or not, there's three on this side, three on the other side. And we're just all in dialogue. And you know when we picked up our phones? At the end of the conversation, when the bill was coming around. That's when we picked up our phones. You see what I'm saying? Now, occasionally you may check the time on your phone. You may look at the clock. But nobody was really out here texting. We were all engaged. Some of us were in separate conversations. One was sports. Some was business. Some was like, oh, you know what I mean? I can't really remember. But it's good, healthy dialogue. But then sometimes you go out and you see people like this, head down. And I'm like, why are you guys out for dinner? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, put the phone either under the table, put it, you know, leave it in the vehicle. Because it's like, be one with one. You know what I mean? Yes. And I feel like too many times we're so distracted by all this technology. There's a time and there's a place for it. You know what I mean? How would a podcast look if I was simply sitting here on my phone like this? Pete's on his phone, you know, doing whatever. But we're talking in and out. People are like, yo, what kind of show is this? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I get when you speak about being in nature. Because sometimes when I go for walks, I'll have just my headphones. I'm really not even taking a look at the phone, like looking at my phone phone. Or sometimes I get more clarity when I'm on the phone having phone calls. And I'm walking because I'm now one between, as you speak to nature, but there's also traffic and whatnot, but I'm not walking in the middle of the street, but I can be very one within my thoughts. And you see that a lot of, a lot of, a lot of business coaches take phone calls now when they're going for walks. And I'm like, okay, I've started to understand things. I'm like, okay, that's pinpointing because you have that clarity. You're aware with one. So I'm happy that you spoke to that. I like that. Mm. Yeah. For sure. Yoga. Very important practice. I need to do it. I feel like I don't have enough time in the hours in the day. <laughs> Things like that. You know, I had a brilliant conversation with, with Ashton August. And it's like, you see how passionate she is about yoga and the divine intervention with it and the things you can discover within self. How long have you been doing yoga and what's some things that you really picked up along your coaching as well i've been doing yoga a long time maybe 30 years but that's not continuous practice i've had spells in and out 
for me, it brings me into my body. And as I'm getting, I don't like to say older, I like to say wiser, just because it empowers me more. I find I, I'm needing it now. And for me, it's more, I guess I'm more aware of what I need to be working on. So if my hips need work, then I'm just really breathing and just being conscious on my hips of stretching that rather than just bang, 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 doing the practice. And I find it a really helpful thing. And this is what got me back into it. It's like, I'm just going to do six sun salutations each morning. Now that does, that can take you 10 or 15 minutes. And then from that, I started to just build stuff into it. Oh, I'm going to do this. Oh, I'll do this now. Oh, I'm going to do warrior. I'll do this. I'll do that. And sometimes I'll free flow. Other times I've got kind of like a way, which is actually from one of August, August Ashton. God, Ashton, I can, it's calling her August. <laughs> Ashton's video. Tongue twister. <laughs> yeah. Of her practice of just hitting all parts of the body. So when you think about your, your coaching, right, do you take parts of yoga and bring it into your coaching? Definitely with the breath. Definitely with the breath of working with breath. But I'm definitely not a yoga teacher and will have that with clients. But there's definitely the element of bringing people into their bodies and having their awareness through breath and breathing practices of different breathing practices. I think that's a big part of yoga, which people don't really talk about. It's just like we in movements and looking fancy, walking around with a yoga mat. It's like I've, I'm going to yoga. I've been to yoga. It's part of a story. But the breath in yoga is such a big, big part of the deep connection to self. And that's the part that I will work with in coaching rather than the movements as such. Mm -hmm. But I do this thing with clients called the 30, it's called the, the Jedi training for 30 days. And it's about getting people into a morning practice over a period of time. And then yet yoga definitely comes into the third week of moving the body. And clients often say, oh, wow, yeah, that, after doing the breathing and the meditation, then coming into your body, it's, we're all one thing, right? And it's bringing that center together, which I encourage. Why do you call it the Jedi, the Jedi mind? Because it gets me, it's how does the Jedi show up? Yeah, what would the Jedi do now? And I'm not really a Star Wars fan, but the Jedi, that's a high frequency <laughs> energy, right? If you're a Jedi, is, you're on a high frequency, is. right? Mm -hmm. If you're a king, like the king of England or a Jedi, what would you rather be? Well, obviously a Jedi, come on now. Yeah. And that's a cool question, right? I've never thought of that, but just in that moment, like, would you rather have your face on all of the money or be a Jedi? So for the ones, <laughs> that's a good question. It's a trick question because it depends on the type of mind that we're in. Yeah. I would say still say Jedi because the yeah. Jedi can do some, do some amazing things. You got the force, which is the force is what's inside of you. But not everyone can use the force correctly true now we're speaking to the sith lords because they were over consumed mm. power see what i just did there i hope people didn't miss what we just did there <laughs> mm. you know what i mean because to be a king you have all that power jedi can have power also too but you know how to harness your inner yeah right? it's the inner power when you have... opposed to external exactly exactly I hope they just saw what we did there because I'm getting, I'm getting goosebumps right now. I'm getting goosebumps because it's, nice. it's just that synergy piece. You know what I mean? Because I think what I do here is, again, I make conversations real and I make moments where, people, where, where the audience, any man or any woman, even children can actually take up, pick up and be like, okay, I'm hearing what's going on. I'm starting mm -hmm. to really understand. Well, let me sift through. It's like the king and the Jedi, which you want to be, right? So. For sure. You know, I look at times in life. We're at the time of recording. It's been like the fourth quarter now, officially. How is one way you could speak to the audience about 
understanding through the distractions where we have Canadian American Thanksgiving, then you have, you know, you're going into your holiday seasons, Christmas, Christmas parties, all of this, and then New Year's and you're doing it all over again, full calendar year. What are three ways they can get set with understanding intention and producing forward with their goals? So the first would be to have a morning practice to set the stage for you for that day before you interact with anybody else, any phone, anything, meditation, breath work, some yoga, some movement, some exercise, then a nice bath. I speak a declaration each morning about what I want to become and have a spa and center myself and connect to nature, then put something nourishing in my body. So I show up like that before anything else before anybody else, because that's where I want to come from. And I think there's this thing where we're chasing all the time, but I need to be really grounded and centered before I can help anybody else. My cup needs to be full and overflowing to give. So that would be the first thing. The second thing is to know what you want and the direction that you're going in. So you can set your intention. Oh, I, I would like this in the future. I would like that to write it down, to be super clear. And that can change, but having a direction to go in. And then the third thing is to make a decision that you're going to do it and then take the action. Because you can make a decision and do nothing and nothing's going to change. When you no, absolutely. Action, absolutely. Yeah. Then that changes it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so good at what, it's so good at what you say, because again, it lands. It's like. You always hear folks say, make your bed. <laughs> Not too many people make their bed. They just roll up out of bed, go to the washroom, wash their face, morning coffee, and that's it. Then they start their day. And you're like, oh, wait, you kind of missed some steps there. It's like, yeah. how do you become one with yourself? Believe it or not, when I get one with myself is actually through my morning coffee. Believe it or not, that's where I get caught up on majority of the things that it is I need to do. So I'll take that time. You know, instant coffee. I know the audience don't come for me. Sorry, I don't do the French press, all that stuff. I just, instant coffee. <laughs> this is how it is, right? And for me now, it's like, then I set, okay, what are emails looking like? And then make time for myself. So I kind of, I do it in a reverse way, but I still get everything done. So I'm like, okay, you know what? If I need to sit here and need to work, I focus on work. And that's what I focus on. If I need to do a podcast, I'm focusing on a podcast. That's what I'm doing. You know what I mean? And all that good stuff. Yeah. And what happens before you... the instant coffee? What happens before? Hmm. I like that you say that. See, I like that you're saying that you call me out. You know, I feel like it's lately, it's going to sound crazy. I'll go to the washroom, do what I need to do. And then I find myself just standing in a anywhere up like because i live basically three floors so i'll stand and i'm just reflecting no phone in hand nothing i'm just reflecting i just stand there i just you know get feel the vibration see what's going on because over here like it's like when i get up now i'll get up now like say 6 six thirty. it's just starting to become the crack of dawn right mm -hmm. but then once daylight savings time comes around it's going to be what do they say? Longer, shorter nights, longer, wait, whatever they say, right? Mm. Not going to hear you here to fact check that. And I just find myself now standing and being grounded with, with everything that's going on. It's weird. And it just happens naturally. And lately it's been happening a lot more, right? So wake up, do what I got to do in the wash, and I just stand there. And then I make my movement. Then I go downstairs. Then I do my coffee. And that's what. Cool. Why do you ask that question out of curiosity? Well, I, yeah, I just, I wondered what happened before, because when you told the story before about our people, they just, they get out of bed, they go to the bathroom, they grab their coffee, to be straight. I heard that from you as well. And that's why I was interesting whether there was something that you just skipped over because it was familiar to you of what you did. Mm -hmm. But then you got to the coffee. Yeah. And if I was really going to ask and be curious it was like well why the and there's something about the instant for you of the instant coffee that it, it has to be fast and i'm hearing that that's a really magical time of your day 
because that's where things happen. Yeah. So for me, I'll say this. I'm all about productivity, right? So I want what I can get done in the quickest amount of time. Like I can do the Keurig, but like, yo, that shit takes too long. <laughs> Let's be honest. Like you got to put the thing down, put the water in. People can say you can put the water in before. I get it, folks. I get it. But it's like instant coffee's right there. The kettle's boiled. I just pour, bam. Sometimes it's not even like it has to be piping hot. It can be lukewarm. I just don't drink iced coffee. I don't never jumped on that craze. I'm never going to, right? So for me in that time, that's where it's like, what can I now get done? I'm always setting up what's productivity looking like. You know what I mean? Because in a day in a life of morning coffee, you sit there, you let that settle, you do what you need to go do. Then you're off to the gym. Then you come home and then you get your stuff done. Then you eat, things like that. So very similar to what I like a lot of high performance folks do. But it's just time crunch, time crunch, especially when you have no, I got to start work at 11 o'clock between six and a, six and about 1045. What can I do to impact to set up? Right. And you're putting an hour in the gym, then you got to shower, do all that stuff. And then you sit, you know, and you sit in front of your desk, you do what you need to do. And that's it. And I think that when folks are listening to what's being said here, it's just know why you're doing it. I find it, like, Pete, I'll be honest, I find it wild that some folks are like, oh, I don't get up until, like, 9, 10 o'clock. Like, excuse me? What time do you start work again? <laughs> some folks just roll out of bed, and they're just showering, yeah. they're at work. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. It's like, what, what, like it's, it baffles my mind. I'm like, well, what do you, it's not like what you're living for, and it's not to call folks out, right? But it's like, what are you doing? Right. Like there's a time and there's a place for everything. And I'm pretty sure like if I was to ask you, what is your vice? What is it you love doing when you're like downtime? If it's with family, if it's with friends, if it's by yourself, because we all have a vice. Mine, I'm playing a little bit of video games, it never hurt nobody, but I'm not letting it over consume me because nine times out of 10 now, if I'm playing video games now, Pete, I'm thinking of what the next thing I could do, because like I'll be like, let me play a round of whatever it is. Maybe. I can send that email to somebody. Maybe I can revisit that DM and have that conversation. You know what I mean? Product things are mm -hmm. productive. That's going to be like going forward. But then have that time to yourself where you can say, "Hey, listen, I'm going to order a pizza and chill and just vibe out and watch what I need to watch on TV and things like that." You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. What's coming up for you when you hear that? What I hear from you from you or from me? Just like in general, just in general. Yeah, I think that, oh, yeah, it's careful of, of which way to go. From you, I'm hearing that that really benefits you is taking some time for yourself. And then when you're taking that time for yourself with a vice, it's actually really productive for you. For me, I need to switch off and have things that are my vice, whether that's in the garden, whether that's going out and taking photography, whether that's just going out with some friends and having some dinner just hanging with my family and watching a movie. That's part of living as well. But as if you're playing videos from 6.30 in the morning till 10.45, and then you're checking your email and going to bed at 11.30, that's a missed life. <laughs> but if there's all this production and there's a small amount of video games, I think that's healthy. It's like drugs, right? Yeah. I, I'm a drug addict, a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. But I've got a friend there and he's just like, oh, I'll give myself a hard time. I had an all-nighter on Friday. When was the last time you had one? Well, I don't even remember. Maybe Christmas. Recreational. Amazing. That's what they're there for, drugs, right? Recreational, having a good time. I don't have that ability. And if, if these things are in snippets, if everything's in balance, epic. That's living life for me. What does overcoming adversity look like and feel like for you? Okay. So I think overcoming adversity for me, which has happened a lot in my life, at the time can feel heavy and confusing, but that can often be a gauge for me. There's like, okay, you need to step through this. A little bit like if we're standing on a ledge and we're going to jump. When you feel that fear, then jump. Because otherwise that fear is going to hold you back for a period of time and sometimes for a really, really long time. So I always know that on the other side of it, there's going to be growth, there's going to be 
a feeling of accomplishment from going through something. When I look back at my career, at relationships, people that have come and gone from my life that I've made a choice, alcoholism, I had a really good time when I was drinking and taking drugs, but I nearly died. So to stop that and to say no when there's voice all the time, it's like, come on, come on, come and play, come on, oh, just one more, oh, let's do another one. No, no. So it's kind of, I'm hearing myself now, it's, it's coming into that center of like, this is what I choose to take this path. And that might be uncomfortable and the adversity walking through that can be the, the shedding, the letting go of what's not serving me to step through. And hey, we both know when we get to the other side, if it really doesn't feel good, you can always go back to what you were doing. That option's already there. In AA, they used to say, hey, if you don't like it, you can go back out there and re we'll refund your misery. misery. It's there for you. So for me, it's about stepping through something with the courage to overcome the challenge because I hear the adversity often is a challenge, whether it's the relationship not serving you, the job, or whatever it is, working out what needs to change and walk through that. That lands for me. That lands. So growing up a young one and through mm -hmm. the trials and the tribulations that you've been through, right? Because now we're speaking to the ones that have kids. You've been through that. You said the alcoholism, the drugs. Mm -hmm. What is it you enlist in her or him to not necessarily, I wouldn't say choose the path, but what would you enlist for them to understand what it is you went through and maybe those mistakes that they cannot make? Because all kids are going to make mistakes when they grow up. It's just how do you prevent the precautionary that you have to take? If you want to call it a mistake or if you're looking at it to, you know, as a development tool. Yeah, that is a lesson, right? And I, the mistake, yeah, you know, some of the things I have done have been failures and they are mistakes and I've learned from them. I have two daughters, 15 and 12. And my whole journey and my partner's journey, it's about empowering them to be strong within themselves to make the decisions. Because it's all right for me to say, hey, you're drinking too much, you're this. But if she can't see it or she doesn't see it, she's never going to hear it. So to give her the tools so that she can be aware herself, her, as in both of them, to be able to see what's going on and, and see this self that they can govern to empower themselves has been my biggest journey with them. You know what? It's, it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But they're both pretty in tune. When I look at the alcoholism and addiction, I've always worried that they may have it, especially with my eldest. And it's about saying to her, hey, sometimes when we like things, we can do a lot of them. And then a lot of that thing might not be so good. But when I watch her and I give her sweets or a packet of biscuits, she'll have one and put it away. I don't have that luxury. I can't say no when it's good. I just want more of it. I say I've got moreism. So we've spoken about it at dinner, that it's not a shameful thing. It was just some part of my life that was a different part of me. But they've seen their dad be sober for all of this time. They've never seen him drink, so they don't know that side. And they may have to experience that. And if they do, then I can only be there to support it. To support, not it, as in the dysfunction, but them going through it. Without telling, pointing the finger. Like, hey, this is an experience. And is this really serving Going back to the blinkers, right? It's like, hey, you're walking around with blinkers on. How's that working out for you? Is this good? I don't know any different. Or do you want to know different? Yeah, there's something more. Oh, okay, we can work with that. You have a lot of times where, and I know some folks that have parents, I mean, sorry, I know some folks that have children and then they, they kind of like, they set them up for success in a way. But then it could also resonate somewhat as a failure because I think that, yes, experiencing things at a young age, I don't have any children, experiencing things at a young age, yes, you get to learn, 
But then I also think is you can also set them up in a way where they're like, oh, if you go to a party, I'm going to pick you up at a such and such and time. It's okay to have a drink. It's like you're kind of telling them, see how it feels. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, in the back end of that is you setting that up for them could promote them to be like when they're behind your back. Well, guess what? Mom, dad picked me up from the party. Hey, I had a couple drinks, had a couple. But what happens when mom and dad are not there? Then they pick up the drinks. Then they pick up the alcohol. Then they pick up the this and they pick up the that. And I think that I'm not going to tell people how to parent. And I love what, what you said because it lands again for me. And I want folks to really understand. You have to be careful and be under, you have to be careful and understand what it is you're going to do. What is it you're going to say and what you think you're setting up them to be behind your back and doing. Yeah. Before we get out of here, because you're a brilliant man, and I always like to give the guests back the opportunity, plug all your information, plug your coaching, how to get in contact with you, and like what's the special type of coaching that it is that you do. And if anyone that's listening or watching, they could be able to get in contact with you and things like that. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, just to speak, you know, just because I felt really emotional then as well, of just just mm -hmm. going back on to that last point of being the parent, that I don't think you're ever going to get it totally right. And there's there's no perfection in it. And I just I feel sad and I'd, I want to be this perfect partner, this perfect husband, this perfect dad, and create these perfect beings. It's, it's not possible. There's pain in no, searching for the perfection. and. Yeah, to any parent out there, it's, every child's different. And it's about, for me, really being aware of myself, of how I can show up for each child individually. And for every child, they're all different of what's going to work for them. Because it's so important. More important than plugging me, of the children of this world that are coming through. It's, um, it's a beautiful gift being a parent. I hope you get that opportunity. Oh, 100%. You got to, <laughs> do I say it on the podcast? You got to find the right one first. That's the thing. Yes. There you go. There's your plug. Got to find the right one. Oh, Lord, man. Like, if you don't, then <laughs> it's a lot of issues out there, right? I've seen, not to, not to speak too, too much of that. I'll probably put a pipe in that. But I've seen where relationships can be really, really good, fruitful, blossoming. Or then it can be an actual horror movie. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's why you got to figure out what it is the right one. And I'm always about knowing how to vet the right person. It doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is and whatever you want to date, marry, things like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But yeah, go ahead and uh, plug all the information there again. All right. And okay. um, so, yeah, where can everyone get in contact with you? So probably the easiest way is through my website potentialism.com.au i'm not a big social media person your potentialism on instagram and facebook but i don't post a great deal because it's a it's a time suck i've never got any business from instagram or from facebook all my business comes from referrals the people saying hey you go and have a conversation with this guy and through conversations and people hearing or I'm talking to somebody and they're like, all oh, right, well, what do you do? And what do I do? I don't know exactly because it changes for everybody. But more often than not, I hold a really sacred space for somebody to really work it out for themselves, to really slow down and hold a container where if I'm sitting with you, it is about you. And it's not about anything else. And to slow things down, to create that time to work out what you want, then the steps that you're going to take to get there and then follow that and with women it's i believe all women know and it's just about holding the space and asking the questions for her to work it out for herself and with guys the guys that are coming through definitely a little bit more mentoring with the communication with their partners women their partners are stepping up and they're putting a little bit left behind and they're trying to work out what's going in their body so just bringing them back in to work that out and giving them some tools to get more connected to themselves. But that's kind of the, the brunt of it is 
the deep connection to self of the work that I do. And yeah, I always offer a 20 minute conversation just to see if we're a fit um, with no charge to see if the connection's right. Because if it's not, nothing's going to change. But when the magic is there between the two parties, then things can happen. I only work with a hell yes. It's like, yeah, I'm absolutely in. Yeah. And if it's, oh, I don't know, I haven't got the money, I'm not sure, you're a no for now. And that's totally okay. Totally, totally okay. I don't do a hard sell. There's no pressure, which there is, you know, in this industry of the FOMO and the whole thing. I don't do that. It's like, just show up really and that's authentically I... and see what changes. Yeah. And that's what I appreciate about you. I can't even speak now. Wow. You kind of took me, you took me there. You took me on a journey there. I love this. It's the voice, the voice. If I, if I wanted to give you one thing, that voice is the biggest instrument that you have. I'd love to hear like an audio book of just you because your voice <laughs> resonates a lot. Right. But Thank this you. is how this podcast happened through connection, creation. Yeah. And then the last step is collaboration. You know yeah. what I mean? If you weren't so far, I would say is my friend, I'd love to sit in studio with you again. You know what I mean? Because I feel like there's more we could really get into, you know, yeah. you won, you won, or even do one in nature. You never know. I might come to Australia. I don't want to get eaten by any creatures down there. <laughs> That's the only thing. <laughs> That's my only thing. I'm just like, if I go to Australia, I don't want to see any creatures. Like, cause I don't know how y'all do it down there. <laughs> it's all part of nature though, right? And when you're, you're mm -hmm. part of that nature, you see the snakes, you see the spiders, you're in tune with it. When you're not in tune with it and you knock into stuff, it's like, oh, right, there's a red belly black that could bite me. It's when you're tuned into nature, you're part of it. Like, I'm only a little white guy and I haven't been bitten or eaten up yet. So come, come, you're welcome. My man, you never know what might happen because we're about to take this podcast on the road. So it's all in due time. Everything happens for a reason, my friend. And I appreciate you and I appreciate the hell out of this conversation. I feel like the audience Likewise. is going to really, yeah, the audience is going to be able to take some things from this, from this conversation. So I do appreciate you, Pete. Thank you very, very much for this opportunity as well. It's been a lovely conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.